Good afternoon, everybody. 
Welcome to the Norway Catalonia Medieval Art a Shared Artistic Heritage Event organized by the delegation of the Catalan government to the Nordic countries. Let me begin by thanking the relevant speakers who are introducing today for their participation and contribution to this conference. And thanks to the people who are following us connected via YouTube and let me also mention and acknowledge the commitment of the museums in Vic and Utrecht and the ones in Oslo, Bergen and Trondheim for their cooperative work in the preparation of the exhibition North and South Medieval Art of Norway and Catalonia from year 1100 to year 1350. For the delegation of the Catalan government to the Nordic countries, it is a pleasure to host this event. Despite we would have been glad to celebrate it in Norway due to the situation of the pandemic that we are facing everywhere, the delegation decided to adjust the conference to the virtual format, increasingly used nowadays for better or for worse. So we are very pleased to have it online. The com conference is composed by two parts and an open debate at the end. In order to have a rich debate, I strongly encourage the people who are following us via YouTube in the channel chat to pose your questions so they can be answered by the speakers at the end of the conference. For the first part of it, we count on the participation of two outstanding experts, medievalists and curators. Dr. Justin Krusen from the University Museum of Bergen and Dr. Mark Sureda from Museu Episcopal de Vic. The frame of Dr. Krusen and Dr. Sureda's speeches is the current exhibition, North and South, Medieval Art of Norway and Catalonia mentioned earlier, and now showing at the Episcopal Museum of Vic. Therefore, the content of their presentations will mostly cover the idea of how both regions have been the only ones that have kept art craft and imagery from the medieval art with an emphasis on the value of such art, which represents a common artistic and spiritual landscape in medieval Europe. For the second part of the event, we appreciate the involvement of Dr. Lena Melheim, head of the archeology span department at the Museum of Cultural History of the University of Oslo. We have asked Dr. Melheim whether she can convey to us about the role of museums nowadays, mainly its role for the promotion and enhancing education, ultimately the museum's didactic function towards today's society. How nowadays we can get closer to comprehend history, culture, ancient and old societies in a way that might help us to open a window, or perhaps better to say, to open a new screen of knowledge, enabling us to unravel where we come from and our origins. I believe that both approaches will be complementing each other and will bring many exciting ideas and views and insights to be also shared with you, with the people that are following us and connected virtually. Furthermore, and after the presentations, the idea is to open a debate and discussions with our speakers. Let me say beforehand, before we start with our panelists, that the Catalan delegation is very committed with the Agenda 2030, promoting initiatives and activities orientated to contribute more, more fully to the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. Therefore, and inspired by those SDGs, the Catalan government this year, together with the Catalan civil society, have signed a national agreement in Catalonia, which encompasses what to pursue regarding the SDGs. And in today's conference, the case of SDG number four is the core of it. How to achieve inclusive and quality education for all people, alongside with the promotion of lifelong learning opportunities. For us, it's been essential to broaden this debate, moving towards this direction on how we can contribute with this idea of learning and education. In my view, it is our responsibility to consider the current crash and disruptive moment that we together and worldwide are facing to tackle it. Some may argue that in the new post pandemic world, we need to review and reset what other ideas, with what new learnings, 
what further research must be incorporated to walk towards a better future. Therefore, Catalonia, for Catalonia, the inclusive and quality education is essential, a necessity, because the educational deficit affects not only the person who eventually suffers it, but also the entire society. And recalling Albert Einstein, education is not learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. So true, isn't it? Finally, let's enjoy the opportunity we have now, together this afternoon, listening and getting to know all the work that has been done by the curators and the museums, allowing ourselves to be taken back to a different world, to another time, taken to this medieval period in which travels were to a commonplace, regardless of the difficulties. While recognizing that journeys in the medieval ages were mostly related to religious matters, there were also travels connected with other purposes, diplomatic missions, business, labor, artistic, cultural. Primarily, the monks were the ones that moved around from one monastery to another, equally with artists and master artisans. However, it was thanks to these travels for religious grounds which became an authentic driving force of the European economy, that it was also possible the rise and the change of scientific and te technical knowledge, the change of languages, cultures, styles, and eventually the change of ways of doing. So now let's travel together because ultimately, thanks to this sort of research and exhibitions, like the one that we are introducing this afternoon um, for all of you, we can journey through time in our imagination. Let's start then. It is my pleasure to hand the floor to the first speakers, Dr. Justin Cusson from the University Museum of Bergen and Dr. Mark Sureda from our Museu Episcopal de Big. Both, Justin and Mark, have played a key and major role on the work carried out for the exhibition North and South Medieval Art of Norway and Catalonia, which, as I said earlier, will be the frame of their presentations. Let me remind you that still some days to visit this exhibition in Vic, and I highly recommend it whether you have the opportunity. So, Justin, Mark, thanks again, and it's your turn. Thank you very much, uh, Francisca. Moltes gracias for your um, kind introduction, as well as for organizing this uh, event today. And hello, everybody at home. Welcome to this uh, webinar, webinar, also on behalf of the University of Bergen. Most visitors to Norway uh, nowadays visit the country because of its natural beauty, as found in the fjords, the mountains, and along the long way up north best known among the country's cultural monuments are the unique stave churches, the wooden churches dating from the 12th and 13th centuries. Inspired by pre-Christian wood carving traditions that were inherited from the Vikings, some of these small churches were, make a truly exotic impression. This image you're now viewing shows the best preserved of all Norwegian medieval stave churches, the one in Borgund between the Sognefjord and the Filafjell mountain pass. Much less known is the fact that Norway also possesses a wealth of medieval art objects, including sculptures and panel paintings. Some artworks have remained inside churches, such as this wooden altar baldachin in the Stave Church at Hopperstad on the Sognefjord. It carries a painted cycle of episodes from the life of the Virgin Mary, and was erected around 1300. At the back of the canopy sits a cloth that may be the oldest preserved linen painting all over Europe. Most medieval artworks, however, can now be admired in museums, particularly the University Museums of Bergen and Oslo. Visiting the church art collection in Bergen is like stepping into a medieval church. The visitor is surrounded by a wealth of wooden objects from the 12th to the 16th centuries, most of which have perfectly preserved 
their medieval original painting and polychromy. These include many crucifixes, sculptures of the Virgin and Child, and painted altar panels, so-called frontals. Among the most exquisite polychrome sculptures in the University Museum of Bergen is the so-called Hove Madonna that dates from around 1240. It originates from a tiny little Romanesque church on the south shore of the Sognefjord, from where it came to Bergen around 1140. The sculpture is of the highest possible technical quality and almost entirely clad in gold leaf. It is not known with certainty where this magnificent sculpture, to be seen on the right here, was produced. Although it cannot be ruled out that she was created in Norway itself, for example in Bergen, it would seem more probable that she was imported from overseas. Striking similarities with marine sculptures in Flanders and northern France, such as the Madonna in Saint-Omer, have led to the assumption that she originated from the area around the Strait of Dover. The Hove Madonna is only one illustration of how the study of medieval art is a fundamentally and should be a fundamentally international European affair. Modern state borders are of no use and may even obstruct our view of the many relationships that existed between North and South. And this was the core idea behind the exhibition project North and South, Medieval Art from Norway and Catalonia from 1100 to 1350 that was shown last year in the Museum Katharine Convent in Utrecht in the Netherlands, and which is still on display, as was said in the introduction, in the Museo Episcopal in Bic in Catalonia. This project was a collaboration between the mentioned museums together with the University Museums of Bergen and Oslo on the Norwegian side. Another illustration of the outstanding value of Norway for medieval art history in general is the fact that the country possesses no less than 30 painted altar frontals out of little over 100 examples that are preserved across Europe. These panels adorned the front of an altar and carried paintings of painted figures or scenes. A truly unique example is this colorful frontal from Nedstrin Church that dates from around 1310 and is now preserved in the University Museum of Bergen. It narrates the story of the theft of the true, of the true cross of Christ by the Persians and its recovery by the Byzantine king Heraclius during the sixth century. The lively scenes are painted in a style that shows a strong similarity to contemporary English painting as it survives in stained glass windows and book illuminations, for example. However, the use of pine wood and the presence of Old Norse inscriptions in the circles that surround the scenes clearly indicate that the panel was painted in Norway, possibly in Bergen. Altar frontals were by no means a Norwegian invention, however. The 30 Norwegian frontals are the survivors of a vast European stock of which by far the most have vanished through fires, wars, neglect, reform, etc. It's an intriguing fact that the only other concentration of surviving painted altar frontals can be found in Catalonia. All Catalan museums together possess no less than 55 examples. And this means that Norway and Catalonia together possess around 80% of the total European stock of existing medieval painted wooden altar frontals, which is truly remarkable. The same can be said of painted wooden altar baldekins, of which the example in Hopperstadt Stave Church was shown earlier. Of this object type, even all known surviving examples, only seven or eight in sum, are found either in Norway or in Catalonia. Norway and Catalonia thus reflect and complement each other. The surviving heritage of medieval church art of both countries is among the richest in Europe. The museums of Bergen and Oslo, together with those in Bic, Barcelona, Lleida, Solsona, are among the best of their kind in the continent. It was this idea 
that form the starting point for our exhibition project, North and South, and that we would like to present to you today. It should be made clear beforehand that we have not searched for some mysterious, hitherto undiscovered artistic connection between both countries that lie around 3,000 kilometers apart, because such connections did not exist, or at least not more than between any other parts of Western Europe. Our project presents the medieval artworks as Norwegian and Catalan specimens, examples of a largely lost European heritage. And this is precisely what the colleagues in Utrecht at the Katharina Convent Museum were so eager to have our exhibition on show at their museum. Because in the Netherlands, almost all medieval church art was destroyed during the 16th century iconoclasm. And this means that the medieval art from Norway and Catalonia offer practically the only possibility to reconstruct what the interior of a Dutch church must have looked like during the 13th century. And now my colleague Mark Sureda from the Museo Episcopal de Vic will add some observations from the southern end of our collaboration. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Mrs. Francesca Guardiola and all the team from the Catalan delegation for the organization of this event. Good afternoon to everyone. I simply will join uh, Justin's greetings uh, at the beginning of his speech. Well, uh, uh, Dr. Cruzen has just underlined the richness of the Norwegian and Catalan medieval collections, especially in what refers to altar frontals between 1100 and 1350 and their extraordinary representativeness in relation to a kind of heritage that once existed throughout Western Europe, but that has mostly disappeared. A continent united by that time by a common faith that involved a shared ritual and artistic expression. For instance, this would have made possible for a Norwegian traveler to enter a Catalan church and in spite of architectural differences or a particular pronunciation of Latin, this would have made possible for him to recognize a common spiritual, ritual, and visual landscape. Prova Vita, for instance, the two Christs presented one beside the other in our exhibition that you can see now on your screens. One is the Christ from Greenacker, one of the oldest preserved in Norway, while the other comes from some unknown church of the Western Catalan Pyrenees. The same principle, that of Christ crucified and naked, but crowned and reigning from the cross, is clearly expressed in both sculptures. Resemblance is stressed by the laws of the arms in both cases. For those of you who doesn't know, the Christ, uh, the Christ from Greenacker is that on your right and the Christ from the Catalan Pyrenees is that on your left. Uh, the provenance of every object is uh, nearly indistinguishable to the eyes of an audience not specifically trained in medieval Norwegian or Catalan sculpture then we can easily imagine that the same effect was uh, offered to medieval eyes. The image we have chosen for the exhibition in Big precisely has a purpose to show the sharing of this common language from the very first moment in which a visitor approaches the exhibition. These are the two main elements of our uh, posters and all media communication. As you can see, both uh, these both sent, sent Olaf from Norway and sent uh, Cyprian from a Catalan frontal. Although the axis of our exhibition is not stylistic, particularly in artistic contexts such as that of the so-called linear Gothic style, uh, which uh, spread throughout Europe around 1300, roughly. It is obvious that the same stylistic and iconographic patterns reach the furthest northern and southern edge of the continent. Even if differences in quality are noticeable, the faces of St. Olaf uh, to the left in the altar frontal from Trondheim and of St. Cyprian uh, to the right uh, in the altar frontal from Cabanas, a, a tiny, uh, tiny church near Barcelona, reveal a common way of rendering the aspect of male saints with details just such as the bird without mustache that, uh, that was in fashion by that time. Obviously, uh, there are some differences between North and South. Dr. Cruzen opened his speech with one of the famous Norwegian safe churches. Catalonia in turn is well known for the abundance of Romanesque churches built in stone during the 11th and 12th centuries. 
with a characteristic architectural vocabulary also widespread in Europe. In some of these churches, isolated in the Pyrenean valleys and in other places of Catalonia, in a similar manner as those that were isolated in the Norwegian fjords, not only altar frontals and the sculpture wooden images were preserved, but also a distinctive feature of Catalan medieval heritage. That is, the most important ensembles of wall paintings from that time ever preserved in Europe, now mostly exhibited in museums such as those in Vic and Barcelona. The impressive landscape centered by the celebrate, celebrated World Heritage Church of San Clemente de Taul, uh, on your left, uh, can be only surpassed by the expressive strength and technical quality of its apt painting dated around 1123 and one of the most iconic examples of Romanesque visual arts now preserved in the National Museum in Barcelona. Such differences, however, do not contradict the spirit of the project North and South, but rather contribute to it by means of showing other sorts of possible interactions. For instance, regarding wooden painted panels, Catalonia has preserved some of the oldest examples in Europe from the first half of 12th century nearly one century before the first preserved Norwegian counterparts appear. But the comparison of two wooden painted baldekins from uh, those different contexts, those of Torpo in Buskerud, uh, circa 1250, and the, uh, the one from Rivas in the MEF, or your right, uh, from around 1120s, this comparison, I say, is highly revealing. Not only because of the similarities that indeed exist, both are part of a baldekin or canopy, a furniture, as, as has been told, covering the altar as a sign of honor, rarely preserved in wood in other parts of Europe. And both objects show, despite the difference in time, the same iconography, a vision of heaven presided over by the enthroned of Christ. Also, the differences between these two objects are revealing. Compared to the Norwegian object, the Catalan example, that from Rivers, represents a kind of baldekin built with a flat panel and without columns that may have existed in other contexts out of Catalonia, but of which a few proofs are preserved. And its technique, based on tempera using very expensive pigments such as lapis lazuli, but complemented with the use of linseed oil for some glazing effects, matches with evidences found in the polychromy of some of the oldest Norwegian Romanesque sculptures. This would suggest a common European landscape in the 12th century, not only in visual, but also in technical terms, which is a field to be explored by means of technical analysis of those works of art. This kind of research uh, has a long tradition in Norway. I don't know whether Kaya Collins, Ruth, and Unplader are here together, here with us. Um, in any case, greetings to you if you are here. A kind of studies that uh, I say has a long tradition in Norway, but uh, has started in Catalonia only 15 years, or some 15 years ago, and is starting to give interesting results. In conclusion, all this shows that the common message of this Norwegian and Catalan heritage, medieval heritage, goes far beyond the generic similarity in the objects preserved. It has been our pleasure as curators to deepen in the significance of this comparison that had been pointed out by some scholars along the 20th century, but never explored in a wider exhibition on Rousseau's project. And moreover, this is a project that asserts the significance not only of our separate collections, but of all of them as a whole in the European frame. All three museums leading the project in Utrecht, in Bergen and in Vic are part of a European network of medieval art museums committed with the furtherance of fascination for the European medieval heritage as a fundamental component of European history and self-consciousness. We hope that we have been able to raise a bit of this fascination with this project that unites heritage from Norway and Catalonia in a single message. Thank you for your attention. Impressive and fascinating indeed. I am amazed actually how by getting to know closer all the work you have done and the one you are still doing, we end up understanding a bit better our past in present times, how cultural, political mobility has ultimately defined what we are now and from where we all come from. Thank you so much to both of you for your interesting remarks and for giving us the opportunity of being acquainted with this liturgical furniture which is our heritage too. Thanks for your contribution to this debate. Now, it is Dr. Lene Melheim's turn. Dr. Lene Melheim is the head of the archeology span department 
at the Museum Cultural History of the University of Oslo. In the second half of the conference, Lene will explain to us the role of museums nowadays, how research, dissemination, management would reinforce the didactic function of the museums towards today's society. Lene, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Francesca, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak, and I look forward to the discussions later. In Norway, uh, it is the five university museums in Tromsø, Trondheim, Bergen, Stavanger, and Oslo who have been delegated the responsibility for national heritage protected by law. But the preservation and collection of heritage emerged from private initiatives in the early 1800s. The National Trust of Norway, a still very active organization, was in fact key to the protection of the state churches and other monuments. One of their explicit aims was to make Norway's artistic and architectural heritage known to the general public. The artifacts collected by the Antiquities uh, Commission became the basis for the collections of the University of Oslo, which during the course of the 19th century grew to become a comprehensive collection of archaeological and medieval objects, especially church art. This photo from 1890 shows state church inventory in the medieval exhibition that was on display from 1852 in the newly built university building. Sorry. Soon the collections grew out of these small rooms and a series of Viking ship excavations in the late 19th and early 20th century led to a galloping need for more space and a need for a law that could protect the archaeological heritage. When the first Cultural Heritage Act of Norway was launched in 1905, monuments and artifacts from prehistoric and medieval times were defined as the property of the state. Gabriel Gustafsson, one of the strongest proponents of such a law, and also a pro proponent of a National Museum for Antiquities, stressed the need for a management regime that could secure data for archaeological research and produce popular knowledge about the past. So, management, the production of knowledge, and dissemination to the public were as important back then as it is today. While these processes, not least the excavation of the Oseberg ship burial, went hand in hand with nationalism and state building in Norway, other messages have become more important in the ways the university museums situate themselves. The didactic goals of museums today are very much geared towards understanding their audiences and being relevant. Hence, striving to become more open, more democratic and less elitist. Rather than closing ourselves in on the past and the collections, historical museums have become more and more involved in ongoing debates. Also, we are moving away from monocultural narratives and purely national agendas to a wider range of narratives. In order to actively challenge and counteract the image of museums as passive storage institutions and to bring the grey literature of development-led archaeology into a dynamic cycle of reinterpretation and research, the Museum of Cultural History has developed its RDM philosophy, research, dissemination, and management. This does not just mean that dissemination and management of heritage should be in sync with current research problems. 
our exhibition philosophy is aimed at generating new knowledge and to transgress the borders between the university and society, between researchers and the audience. In line with this, we strive to be groundbreaking, responsible and engaged. Our new core exhibitions on the ground floor of the Historical Museum are designed to be interdisciplinary, research-based and to address diversity and the big questions of society and culture. To put it short, what it means to be human. Over the past decades, we have worked with mobilizing our collections in new ways. The Things Method was a collaborative project between us and the Norwegian Museum of Science and Technology and Oslo Museum. This project focused on the role of museums in society and was highly inspired by French anthropologist and sociologist Bruno Latour and his ideas about science, materiality and democracy. How can museums buy and through things and their materiality open up for input from their audiences and through this vitalize their own research and collections? The idea behind this project is that when you bring things into focus, a new understanding of what they represent the people and communities they involve may lead not just to new understandings, but even create a new arena for involvement. So this is being political in its strictest sense by engaging the community. The things method, in fact, resonates also with how people interacted with objects in the medieval period. Transformation, which is one of our new core exhibitions, explores how faith transformed objects and how objects served as bridges to the sacred and the holy. The audience learns how colors and light in medieval church art were means to transmit, transmit God's powers. Just like North-South, transformation does not have a national agenda but displays our common heritage as Europeans today. Medieval art played a key role in the dissemination of Christian teachings, as exemplified here by the old Save Church ceiling with its 23 mot motifs for, from the Bible. Nobel Literature Prize winner Sigrid Unset considered Catholicism a true and significant force and even a game changer in Norway's history. The Christian Lavranstadt books uh, that she won the Nobel Prize with in 1928 is actually set in the first half of the 1300s AD, the time of the old ceiling. Unset was the daughter of archaeologist Ingvald Unset and knew her archaeological and written sources well. She famously stated that it was due to her knowledge about the past that she was able to understand her own time. In a similar way, one of the goals of a museum today is to allow the audience to travel in times and spaces far away and different from ours, to see our own time with another gaze and be able to reflect upon it. Traveling exhibitions and international loans are important means which allow us to access Europe's diverse heritage. Unset was convinced that people's hearts remain the same despite changing faith and thought systems. While this may be so, and while art and artifacts certainly evoke emotions, there is hardly a universal way to perceive of them. The recent copy of the Hedal Madonna reminds us that the beautifully patinated and worn objects that we showcase in our exhibitions 
were once quite shiny. To a person in the 21st century, perhaps even vulgar. And that despite a sense of familiarity, the emotions they once invoked were certainly different from ours. We should neither forget that our current ideas about heritage, dissemination, and democratic museums are very much a child of our time. Like previous heritage and exhibition strat strategies were children of their time. Heritage has been and will continue to be used in various identity processes. Heritage remains a powerful tool and is too easily used to produce simplifying narratives of the past. Therefore, as museums, we need to constantly and critically address the narratives we create and how they may misrepresent the past and mislead the public. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Dr. Melheim. I would ever go so far as to say that over the future that lies ahead, cultural productions are going to change. However, hopefully, we'll continue visiting museums and hopefully we all will be called by the artwork shown in there. All of us must be questioned by it and the artwork must continue speaking to us. Eventually, some preconceptions might change. Ultimately, our ideas, our ways of thinking might vary due to the work you are undertaking, due to the role your institutions play and perform. Thank you all of the three panelists for your contribution and your explanations. We have come now to the end of the conference. We do have time to spare for some questions. So let's start then and let's share the most commonly and frequently asked uh, questions by our audience, uh, the channel chat. Uh, but before that, I would like to myself posing a question to engage on the discussion. And actually, let me address the first comment to Dr. Spreda, in fact, uh, we were wondering with Mark Sureda recently about the meaning and the purposes of, of the museums nowadays. Lene has brought many interesting remarks in this field. Thus, Mark, uh, why did different institutions in Utrecht, Bergen, Vic, among many other places, also in Paris, Cologne, or Florence, why did they start collecting artifacts in different moments of the 19th century? I addressed this question to Mark, but of course, uh, Justine and Lene, you can share also your comments and contribute to any uh, idea that you consider relevant. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. This is indeed a very interesting question. And uh, I agree that any one of my colleagues could, could, uh, could give an answer to that. And uh, that's true that Daniel Lene has told a lot about it and, and mainly I think has provided the frame for understanding the phenomenon. But to make it short, uh, we, we could say that 19th century was obviously a period of great changes in the Western world, uh, throughout the world, but particularly in Western world. Uh, the, this Western world was looking for its identity in separate countries and in, in a deep sense, uh, all the Western world in, on a whole. And this identity was uh, looked after in the past. And heritage, so the things, uh, using the word uh, by, by Anna Lene, the things themselves were the proof of this past. And uh, the museums were created so that they could collect these objects and then have the proofs and the, uh, the witnesses of this past that were the witnesses of this identity in a narrative that had to do with the national agenda. And this Anna Lene has told it perfectly. We have to keep in mind that uh, history and history of art became academic studies uh, in the modern sense of the world precisely during this, uh, this 19th century that is covered by the whole of our museums. The museum in Bergen was founded in 1825 and our museum in Big was founded in 1889. So this covered the whole, it covers the whole 19th century. And uh, this explains how all these evolved, yeah? both academically and in terms of collecting the objects materially. And this is also remarkable, the fact that by that time, there were no borders between universities and museums, which is a fact that still exists in a very evident way 
in 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 uh, in Norway and Scandinavia, and now we try to work in the same way. So uh, strengthening these uh, these links between museums and universities because we carry on with this research on the objects, but also in the creation of of, of these narratives, uh, modern narratives that uh, Annalena has told about. Yes, if I may just briefly follow up to that. I think it's very interesting. The even if you're interested in the Middle Ages, it's always interesting, as much interesting to look at the 19th century, because it, the Middle Ages come down to us through the filter of the 19th century. And this filter is different in every country. So Catalonia and has its own narrative and invention of its own identity. So did the Norwegians in the 19th century after a long period of foreign um, occupation, so to speak, or being uh, reigned by other countries. The finding of the national identity was very much close, closely bound up to finding the true Norwegian uh, art uh, history. And that art history was found, especially in the Middle Ages, because the Middle Ages was the time before the Danes came. So the most truly Norwegian art was exactly that art from our period, 1100 to 1350. And in the Netherlands, in uh, speaking about Utrecht, um, another interesting aspect is that it has everything to do with the emancipation of Catholicism, because finding the Middle Ages was finding proof of the Netherlands Catholic past. Yeah? The medieval uh, church was the Catholic church before the Reformation. And after three or four ages, uh, three or four centuries of Protestant domination, the Catholics were finding their other, their own identity in medieval art. So there's always a political cultural agenda uh, to it as well. It's not only the interest for the art as beautiful objects or something. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark and Justin. Maybe we can uh, move further because we've got some questions for you. Um, Elisa Markov asks, uh, is anything at all known about the artists, artisans, particularly if they, if they had to train trained abroad or locally. Feel free, any 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 of you can Well, can we, we, we tried to explain this issue and then Justin or Annalena can add uh, to the find necessary. But we, we tried precisely to explain this issue in the exhibition through the comparison of the Madonnas. It's, uh, this is something that is similar in general terms because the, because the artists of this period are particularly but now in the general terms, although many exceptions could be could be evoked. But if you, we look at the Madonnas, uh, the Catalan Madonnas are normally understood as products of local workshops. So uh, in, in the frame of local production, instead the Norwegian artifacts of this kind are normally understood as products made abroad in the north of France or in the German shore or in England and brought to, Nor uh, to Norway or produced by uh, people trained uh, abroad. Maybe Justin, you could add something more precise on that? Yeah, that's been the ongoing discussion since, since the birth of art history, uh, more or less, in Norway. Because it's, it's, and it will be an ongoing discussion as well, because it's just, you cannot establish uh, hard arguments for that. You can only yeah, argue plausibility. Um, for the, the Hove Madonna, which I showed in my presentation, um, the exquisite uh, um, yeah, quality of the, and the use of materials have induced us to think that she, she was probably uh, produced overseas because there the market would be bigger and people with ambitions would be able and willing to go out and travel overseas to purchase the best art of their time. But this is actually, this is not much more than a hypothesis. Sometimes you find hard proof, for example, in the Netstrin frontal, which I also uh, presented, there you have the inscriptions, which are Old Norse. So even if the style looks very English, um, the Old Norse inscriptions point at a Norwegian uh, origin. But I think in general, it's very interesting to note that the medieval art in Catalonia is, is mainly uh, assumed to be local or regional, whereas the Norwegians, we look for the origins around the North Sea, at least. So in, in some sense, then 
maybe Norwegian medieval art is a little bit more international than the, uh, than the Catholic is. Okay, here there is another one. Dick van Dijk asks about, uh, it says, the presentation deals with church buildings and interiors, cultural heritage. Is it an idea to include the music, sounding heritage that has sounded in these buildings in the research? Hmm. Lene? Uh, yeah, uh, I could comment upon that. I think that's a brilliant idea. Uh, and actually, um, in one of the exhibitions that we are planning right now, which is supposed to be the, the last of the uh, core exhibitions, which uh, uh, Karolina Chester, who is present here, uh, is uh, deeply involved in, in, we will also have, have sounds, soundscapes to, to uh, accompany uh, the objects. So I think that's a very good idea, not just for dissemination, but of course also for researching the, the uh, totality of uh, sense uh, and emotional, uh, or, or what you could sense back then. I, I also think it's an excellent idea. I, I think if, you would, if we would have worked that out further in the North and South exhibition, I think you would reach the same conclusion that it's basically impossible to to distinguish medieval music from the north uh, from the music from the south because we're talking about the same liturgy and the liturgy is is basically spoken word music movement so it's it's all about music and scent and everything else but I think the music is basically as north and south as the art is so I think it would only add an extra argument to it so I think I think uh, the um, uh, I think the uh, for I think very much for the question. I think it's an excellent idea. Well, particularly in a religious context, I think that the the effect of music could be compared to the effect of the visual arts or or all the other environmental objects we have been showing yeah, in the expression of the same same uh, Weltanschauung, so to say. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, there is another one. Uh, by Ines Garcia, and it is addressed uh, to Mark Sureda regarding mm -hmm. uh, your previous explanation. Ines says, um, would you say that this critical questioning is being done in our Catalan museums? Well, I do think all professionals working in museums are constantly putting themselves this kind of, this kind of questions. It is normal that you have an agenda for the narratives in your museums and you have to be honest, but then you have uh, different, uh, different things that you can put uh, together when, when you choose your narratives. But I think if, if a museum is so, and I think uh, our museums in Catalonia are enough, developed enough, I mean, you are constantly putting this kind of, this kind of questions as, uh, as they are being put by professionals in other museums throughout Europe. It's always something that you, you, will, you will have in front of you. Uh, and, and obviously the circumstances have an influence in every place and in every time. But I think we professionals uh, struggle to do that. Okay, perfect. Um, we've got, I mean, we've got the last question, the question which has been posed by by uh, staff from the delegation itself. Uh, we've got curiosity. I think this is something that can be addressed to all of you, the three of you. And this notion of museums as, as places, as spots to store and display artwork, Lenny has tackled a bit uh, this, um, this, uh, this idea. But this view of museums, which has been the traditional expressions of museums uh, to be a place where to display artwork, how about now, uh, the current moment and the, the, the current times that the museums are being more open to comprehend uh, themselves as a place where the research and the studies are the central element to and are the bottom line 
for future exhibitions, for future showing of the, of the artwork. Maybe the three of you can add something uh, with this idea and then we can leave the Q&A uh, after this, after your answers, if it's okay. Who starts? Now, I think just to make it short and then it's up to you, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of things done in this sense and there's a long way to go. Uh, all institutions start with, uh, in, a, in, a, in, some, in some way and then they evolve. So we are in a constant evolution and we, we have to catch uh, the way to evolve in our contemporary world. Uh, this, this is a, an old question for us, people who work in museums, but I think uh, this question will be stressed now due to the particular circumstances that, that uh, arise now in, throughout the world due to the coronavirus and the crisis and the, the difficulties in, in moving. So new media and new ways to show what we are and what we, uh, and what we want to tell uh, will be found in order to accomplish our mission. But yes, yes, there is still the old idea of a museum as a place uh, where things simply stay and the open is, uh, the, 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 the door is open in the morning and close uh, the evening and that's all, uh, that's, that's not the truth. Uh, the universities started as places where you went to learn something that was told by the teacher and you had no opportunity to believe anything else. And it, it, this has evolved a lot. So we are in constant evolution. It, it's it's ordeal to, to keep forward with that. If I just may follow up, uh, the I think museums like all of ours, Oslo, Bic, Utrecht, Bergen, offer perhaps together with monuments around in the countryside, but the, the most direct possible access to the past. Um, and I think this makes for an excellent material to discover, for example, also with, with uh, groups of youngsters. Uh, invite, we invite a lot of school uh, classes to come to the museum and discover aspects of Norwegian history that cannot be taught in the classroom. I mean, you can read books, you can read texts, and it's all work perfectly, but I think the confrontation with the tangible uh, relics of the past is just unbeatable and, and it works. But I think the task of the museum then is not only to expose it, but also to explain it. And that is a very interesting dynamics because if you look back to in history to the museum, the museum in itself has also in a way become heritage because it's like a series of perspectives that have been adopted to uh, explain uh, the art. So if we look back to almost 200 years in history, for the first generation in the museum, the truly Norwegian identity um, sort of uh, embodied by these artworks was the, the core thing they were after, as I told. And then afterwards it became different. Then it became artistic expressions, for example. My predecessor at the museum put a lot of emphasis on the religious uh, uh, um, perspective, on the religious um, aspect of the art, which is fundamental to, the, to their understanding. And what mm -hmm. I have been trying to do also together with uh, Mark and with the colleagues in Utrecht and anywhere else, is to try to add this cultural history perspective and to try to see what the art history of Norway tells us about, let's say the place of Norway inside the European family of nations in, during the Middle Ages or something. How are things connected to England, to the Netherlands, and even by parallelity to Catalonia. So it just a, sort of puts Norway on the map culturally in, in Europe. I think that that is the task of the museum to add that layer of explanations. Yeah, I very much agree with uh, what uh, Justin just said. And I, I think that's, uh, so important and will continue forever to be very important. It's uh, what I said about uh, the things being involved in different kinds of networks. That is basically what Justin is now talking about. It's the cultural, historical, historical, uh, social, whatever uh, context of that object. So if we just put up the object in a very aesthetic way and present it as as artwork, then we may lose some dimensions. So I think the balance between showing the beauty or the pure object, but also to provide the contextualization of that object is really Absolutely. important. Absolutely. 
Perfect. Uh, I said that this would be the last one, but we've got another question. I think uh, we have spare time to, uh, to pose uh, this last question by Gerardo Botto. Um, he's, he asks, this international scope, how could be possible to explain in West East perspective in Europe? Always very difficult after year 1054. If you can be short in your answers, any of you, please. Houston, it's up to you, I think. <laughs> You think so? <laughs> well, I, I think the the north and the idea behind north and south was that we are we've been looking for um, for relationships within what can be called the Latin West. So because we chose the the liturgy as the point of entry, so we looked together at all the peoples of Europe that followed the same liturgy, which produced similar art forms, and then. Uh, reconstruct their, the way they were connected. If you look at east-west, where as the uh, the question uh, the one the Gerardo has, has pointed out is is very different east and west uh, because since 1054 and even before that the ritual and the, the also the, the the mental world that it represents is very different. We're talking about Greek Christianity and Latin Christianity, which has a lot of points in common but also a lot of differences. So I think East and West wouldn't work in the same way as North and South have done. Perfect, thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. Uh, and also thank you to the audience, to the people that have posed uh, the questions. I think uh, we have had a rich debate at the end of the conference. Uh, for the Catalan delegation to the Nordic countries, uh, we are thrilled and honored for the opportunity of developing our job, working together with institutions from Catalonia in collaboration with institutions in the countries in the North geography. The happy coincidence of this exhibition has allowed us to do so. Thanks again. And I encourage to all of us to work more towards this idea of cooperation hereafter. And now, please enjoy the video of the exhibition North and South Medieval Art of Norway and Catalonia, year 1100 to 1350. I would like to remind you again that still some days to visit this exhibition in Vic. It will be worth. Thank you so much.